It's an ambitious non-Western platform. The Shanghai Cooperation Organization holds yet another summit on the heels of a global trade war. But what difference does this group make on the world stage? And could it be a front that's united against the US? This is Inside Story. Hello, welcome to the program. I'm Adrian Finnegan. Leaders of the Shanghai Cooperation Organization are in Kyrgyzstan for an annual summit. Led by China and Russia, the eight-member Eurasian bloc accounts for almost half of the world's population. The meeting comes as tensions grow between the US and China over their escalating trade war. Meanwhile, Iran is seeking support against Washington's maximum pressure campaign, but regular conflicts between members namely India and Pakistan, cast doubt on whether the bloc can challenge the existing world order led by the US. Al Jazeera's Robin Forestia-Walker reports now from Bishkek. Now that India and Pakistan are members, full members of the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, the club would like to be taken very seriously on the world stage because it represents 43% of the global population and a quarter of global gross domestic product. It's about forging new strategic alliances and that became apparent very much today with Iran which has observer status attending President Rouhani uh, criticizing the United States, um, defending Iran against the allegations that it was involved in the attacks on those oil tankers and finding very much uh, some support amongst other member states like China and Russia, both of whom have their issues with the US, Russia under sanctions for, annex for its annexation of Crimea, China now uh, under pressure over Donald Trump's uh, trade war. Now, these countries are very much interested in regional cooperation on uh, the, the economic trade, opening up new trade corridors, and of course, counter-terrorism. They talk about being partners, but it is also worth bearing in mind that within the organization, there are big differences, uh, rivalries between these countries. Let's take, for example, Russia and China. Both have very uh, significant interests in maintaining influence in Central Asia. And with Pakistan and India, both member states, those two countries having continuing uh, difficulties, ongoing differences, with India accusing Pakistan of aiding and abetting terrorism. So there's a lot of rivalry within this organization, as well as partnerships between those member states. What exactly is the Shanghai Cooperation Organization? Well, it's a political, economic and security alliance led by China and Russia since 2001. It has eight members, India and Pakistan, joined in 2017. Other members include Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan and Uzbekistan. Iran has been trying to become a full member but remains for the moment an observer, along with Afghanistan, Belarus and Mongolia. The organization represents 40% of the world's population, with more than 20% of global GDP. Its role has been expanded from security to other areas like trade, energy, culture and transportation between member states. The bloc is increasingly being seen as a means of countering US economic and military power. So let's bring in our guests for today's discussion. Joining us from Moscow, Alexei Klepnikov, foreign policy analyst with the Russian International Affairs Council. David Arase is professor of international politics at SAIS, Hopkins Nanjing Center. He joins us now via Skype from Nanjing. And Richard White, security analyst at Wikistrat in Washington, D.C. Richard, let's start with you. How much geopolitical heft does the Shanghai Cooperation Organization have? Is it anything more than a back-slapping opportunity in talking shop from your point of view? The organization has always underperformed its potential. If you were just to add together the population, the industrial power, the military power of all the members, um, that aggregate is significantly greater than how the organization itself has been able to act as a unified bloc. This is a good question, though, because for a while, when it was first set up, 
there was concerns in the West, particularly Washington, that this was going to become some kind of anti-NATO, some kind of authoritarian international structure that Russia, China, and other countries would join in and act as a unified bloc to balance the United States and also to drive it out of the heart of Eurasia. But I would argue it, the organization has never been able to function that way because of some disagreements among its members, a lack of a strong infrastructure inherent to itself and other challenges. David Arase, would you agree with that assessment? How important is this bloc to China in particular and its Belt and Road Initiative uh, with the, the still escalating trade war with the U.S. right now? Yes, I think Richard's uh, right. Uh, it has been an underperformer, but the SCO for China is strategically important because it, uh, uh, if it can do what China needs, which is to stabilize uh, Central Asia and reconcile differences and rivalries it has with Russia, uh, this will go a long way toward helping the BRI succeed because the the main land uh, connectivity corridors of the uh, all go through Central Asia, so uh, it, it's very important. Alexei, I mean, what what are the organization's aims and ambitions? What does it see itself as, and 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 who's in the driving seat, Russia or China? Well, in the first place, we shouldn't forget that uh, SCO uh, didn't appear as a counterbalance to NATO or to any other uh, regional or global organization. In the first place, it's a regional unity which unites uh, regional countries to tackle regional problems. In the first place, it's uh, counterterrorism, security, uh, uh, stable development, and then economics. So this is why it's important for those countries um, who are currently members and are attracting new members to actually to perform as an alternative um, uh, to the existing global organization, but not in a way uh, as a competing one, but underlining the value and the rising importance of the regional blocks, which can tackle more effectively the regional problems uh, on the regional level, whether it is uh, the problem in, uh, in Afghanistan, whether it's Iran or it's uh, other problems uh, in, in Central Asia, which is uh, crucial for all member states. But Alexei, as things stand at the moment, is it failing to fulfill its potential as a bloc? Well, um, of course, it uh, wants to uh, gain more uh, weight and political weight and economic weight in terms of, but as my colleagues rightly uh, indicated that it's under, uh, it underperforms uh, hugely, given that uh, it accumulates a um, bigger part of the world, uh, you know, economic power, uh, population, and even political power. It underperforms uh, in, in, in real terms. So this is why I would argue that uh, they try to focus more on, um, on regional issues uh, for which are a concern for the members at most, not for, you know, the, the, uh, the global community. Richard, of course, a lot has changed since the bloc met, met in June last year. China now finds itself embroiled in, in a trade war with the US. India-Pakistan relations hit a new low earlier this year. We've got Iran coming under pressure from the US and its, its Gulf allies. Um, all of that sets the scene for what could be a fascinating uh, meeting. What do you think we can expect? No, I think that it raises, it's going to increase the uh, internal tensions, raise them uh, within the bloc. So China may wish to secure the bloc's support for its position on some of the economic disputes it has with the U.S., you know, call for de-emphasizing the dollar or building up an alternative economic trade structure uh, and so on. But a country like India, even Pakistan, would be hesitant to back an, an explicitly anti-U.S. approach. Russia may, for similar reasons, want to use the bloc to attack the U.S. position on you know, Iran, and I'm sure they have an Iranian support on this. But again, some of the other countries are going to be a bit hesitant to address this. 
We've also got the interesting issue of some recent internal developments within key countries. I mean, new elections in India didn't change much, but certainly we've had different uh, rule, t leaders take charge in Uzbekistan and more recently in Kazakhstan. So the dynamics, I think, will be much more fluid, but I think that will lead mostly to paralysis. I think the communique will be very bland, um, and I think that some country like China is going to try and focus its efforts on other institutions where it has more control, BRI, for example. David, do you agree that we'll get a, a bland communique? Does, does the, the US-China trade war yeah. give other SCO members leverage over China right now? Is China's position in the bloc weakened because of the trade war? Well, it, it has to turn more toward uh, the continent because it's, it's, it's encountering a lot of uh, problems on its uh, you know, Pacific periphery and with the trade war with the U.S. and strategic tensions. But to get back to why it's an underperformer, um, it, you know, it, it's, it, the problem is that the big three, you know, China, Russia, and India, you know, each want to be uh, strategically independent, uh, autonomous. Uh, and, you know, but China's in a position to be a dominant power uh, in Eurasia. It's, you could arguably, a global power, uh, a rival to the United States. Russia and India are sort of wannabe great powers. They're regional powers, but they, they would like to uh, achieve great power status. And so this, uh, because they have these a uh, ambitions, uh, it's very difficult for them to, to agree to any meaningful an important uh, cooperation between them, whether it's security or, or economic, because the, the, uh, the, the, the ambitions of these three uh, are, in, in a way, mutually incompatible, even though they all want to promote Eurasian integration. Uh, the terms on which they want to do it, uh, you know, uh, there, there, won't, there won't be any common agreement on, on how exactly to do this. Does that mean, David, that, that they can never be allies in the true sense of the word? That they're, they're merely countries who maybe are willing to work with each other in a, a, a loose affiliation? That's correct, yes, because each of these powers wants to remain strategically autonomous, which means they cannot, uh, unless absolutely forced, uh, they, they will be very reluctant to, to, to form an alliance uh, and uh, particularly if it's an alliance against the United States. Um, uh, although I have to say the U.S. is doing a good job of driving them together. Uh, but, uh, but I think their internal differences, uh, China, China versus India, serious problems, Russia versus China, serious problems. India, Russia, not so bad, but, you know, China doesn't want uh, the India-Russia uh, axis to get too strong. So, you know, uh, they're... They're they're at they're at uh, sixes and sevens inside that organization. Alexei, um, Iran has observer status at this meeting. It wants in, though. Will it ever be invited to join the grouping? Do you think? And and what would that mean for the dynamics of of the group that that David was just talking about? There. Well, uh, from the beginning, the uh, SEO wasn't that uh, extensive. And as we know, that uh, India and Pakistan just recently joined the organization as a full members. And now we have uh, four uh, observer members, uh, including Iran. So I think ultimately Iran will become the part of the organization. And that is inevitable for, for any kind of organiz uh, organization. Uh, coming back to the uh, larger picture of ACO uh, role and uh, three powers, which were m mentioned by my colleagues. We should also not forget that SEO is not the only platform where these uh, parties can uh, talk and negotiate. They also have BRICS uh, platform. They also have G20 platform and a uh, whole bunch of other platforms. So it's um, the, the importance of such format is not uh, in uh, in the ability to, to talk to each other, because or I would argue that this country built their relations uh, between each other on bilateral uh, basis rather than on multilateral. So, and it's hard to uh, imagine that uh, on the level of BRICS or SEO, uh, China, Russia, and India uh, will, or any uh, Pakistan, uh, maybe in the future Iran, can come up with some, you know, breakthrough. 
uh, deals or agreements. Rather, we can expect that on bilateral basis between Russia, India, Russia and China, China and Iran. Um, so I think that's uh, more important to, to keep track. And also another comment on uh, the, this, uh, the argument that this uh, interests of Russia, China and India are mutually exclusive. I wouldn't say so. I would rather to look at this uh, from a different angle, saying that uh, they can more uh, to be complementary to each other. Of course, no one can argue Chinese dominance, uh, economic dominance, but uh, together with uh, without India and Russia on board, Chinese initiative One Belt, One Road is hard to come to fruition. This is why China needs to have uh, and develop contacts with all these important uh, actors if it wants uh, its initiative, economic initiative, integration initiative to, to eventually succeed. Richard, I just want to pick up on, on something that you were saying earlier about the, this grouping uh, originally when it, was, uh, when it was first perceived being viewed in the US as um, a potential rival to, uh, to other political or military uh, alliances, uh, perhaps a, a threat to the US and, and its interests. And, and what do you make of what David was just saying there, that at the moment uh, the foreign policy uh, yeah. uh, in, in the US is, is kind of backfiring with the US doing a good job of, of, of driving these countries together? Right. So the original context of the concern was during the, uh, you know, during the U.S. intervention in Afghanistan, the grouping came out with a statement saying, well, you know, now the war is winding down, it's time for the U.S. troops to leave. And this was seen as an effort to have the U.S. leave both the bases in Uzbekistan and, then, and Kyrgyzstan. And, and, and both that occurred, though arguably for different reasons. Um, and so that was seen at that time, which would have been, I think, around 2005. Uh, Donald Rumsfeld made some statements to the effect that he saw this as potential anti-U.S. bloc. Since then, I think, uh, as, our, you know, as Alexei has said, it's been focusing less on traditional security issues, more on transnational countering terrorism, um, various plans for economic development, more social development. They have a SEO spirit that they like to put forth. And it's not, it's not directly moved into the area of military security. Um, and then since then, as you mentioned, President Trump's been elected and he's pursued policies um, that, uh, have not, that Russia, China, India, and other members have not fully agreed with. But it's not been a military threat to these countries. It's more been an economic challenge. And here, they each are pursuing basically their own route. So China has been relying more on its, its global preponderance, the BRI initiative, and so, and so on, to try and allow, counter US actions. Russia has tried to get China to back it but not been very successful. So it's been relying primarily on uh, its own Eurasian uh, economic union uh, and, and encouraging Russia domestic production. And then India has been basically tried to deal with the US directly, still not to try and join competing blocs. And the other members in the middle, Iran would arguably have the most interest in seeing these countries aligned together, which Iran being a partner but it's not a full member. I don't think that will occur soon. I think that given the state of Iranian relations with the U.S. and other countries, that would be seen as too provocative. So despite the perhaps U.S. policies trying to challenge each of them, we haven't yet seen them aligned together within the SCO. That may occur in other areas, but not within this bloc. Uh, David, um, some of the thorny issues that exist between member states and China are often politely ignored at these, these annual summits uh, and, and deemed perhaps internal matters for China, the Uyghurs in, in Xinjiang, uh, for instance. Why yeah. is that? Well, because uh, the reality is that uh, those most directly, you would think, most directly interested in defending the Uyghurs, that is their, their, their brothers and cousins in Central Asia uh, and, and even Turkey, uh, don't really want to say anything to anger China because they're so economically dependent on China. So they they're not going to raise that issue. Um, will, will they at least, David? Will, will, they, will they at least face complaints, perhaps, 
uh, or will China face complaints behind the scenes, you know, behind closed doors about, for instance, that the cost of, of, of the Belt and Road projects that, that are undergoing at the moment and, and the debt that it places on these countries? Uh, yes, I, I think uh, India, no doubt, will will have a say because, you know, India has to also justify why it's not a member of the BRI, why they haven't uh, attended either of the BRI uh, forums, uh, mo the most recent one being uh, just uh, just uh, uh, in April. Um, and so, uh, for sure, India will bring up, uh, you know, an, you know, in a sort of uh, sly way, uh, the problems of BRI. And, you know, India is also going to press uh, China on the terrorism issue. Uh, now, terrorism is something that China takes seriously, uh, but when it comes, except when it comes to Pakistan. So, you know, I think you can expect Modi to, to press China uh, on, that, on that particular issue. Uh, and then uh, there's the there's this the Russia India axis is very interesting because and Iran has a role to play here because uh, you know India's plan for establishing uh, overland connectivity to Europe through Russia has to go through Iran and as long as uh, Iran is facing U.S. sanctions it's going to be very difficult to achieve that so uh, what I'm what I would be looking for actually is some kind of statement uh, by the SEO members on the, on the Iran situation the sanctions it faces and because uh, you know, both China and India are heavy buyers of Iranian oil, uh, and India needs to uh, to further its plans for connectivity to Europe and to bypass the BRI. It, it needs to have uh, Iran uh, able to conduct normal, you know, uh, tr uh, commercial relations with the rest of the world. So, uh, you know, this is one area, I think, uh, where... Uh, the uh, U.S. policies, uh, I, you know, I can understand uh, individually uh, you know, why the U.S. is imposing sanctions on, on the various members. But when you when you add it all up and see the result, uh, you ha you also have to consider uh, that um, you know uh, it, it may it may in a way uh, kind of push the SCO members together in a way that may actually give the appearance of it becoming anti-American, although I'm not sure that would be true, but on certain specific issues, for example, on Iran, you might see okay. some, you might see some consensus. Uh, Alexei, Iran is, is there uh, as an observer nation. Do you, do you think that, I mean, it would be delighted if, 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 uh, if it was uh, mentioned in, in the final communique, do you think that will happen? Well, I... I don't think that um, all members would, uh, you know, be that united in using Iran as a, you know, reason for anti-U.S. rhetoric. Uh, even without Iran, uh, already uh, anti-American rhetoric being uh, on the summit because uh, um, uh, Iranian president and, and uh, Chinese reps and Russia uh, underlined already how United States basically contributed to the uh, lack of security in this region, in, in Central Asia, in the Middle East, which affects uh, all parties of uh, all members of the SEO. So, and uh, coming back to the um, remark on whether SEO is anti-American or not, I wouldn't say, or I wouldn't look at this as, uh, I mean, uh, such organizations are created not for the sake of being anti-something, uh, they're rather created to be more for something. And here, uh, this is exactly the, the case when SEO is created for, I mean, as a platform for the states to uh, promote and push their uh, agendas and their and uh, as a platform to tackle uh, original issues. Okay. I mean, look at the case of India and Pakistan. Uh, despite of being rivals uh, for, for decades and even enemies, they managed to actually become uh, members of this organization. And it's another additional channel of communication, another platform for them to come together and discuss things, to sit together with uh, other members okay. who are also important players in the region right. and discuss um, uh, uh, issues of common interest. Okay. Gentlemen, there I'm afraid we must end uh, our discussion. Many thanks indeed for being with us. Alexei Klepnikov, David Arase and Richard Weitz.
And thank you for watching. Don't forget you can see the programme at any time just by going to the website at aljazeera.com. For further discussion, join us at our Facebook page at facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. And you can join the conversation on Twitter, our handle at AJ Inside Story. From me, Adrian Finnegan, and the whole team here in Doha, thanks for watching. I'll see you again. Bye for now.